Hello and welcome to Sunday School Online with Central Baptist Church. I'm Bob Fife, and it's uh, this lesson is for August 21st, 2022, and the lesson is Lord Teach Us to Pray. And of course, we're continuing in our study from our three, six, Connect 360 in prayer. So today's lesson is some very common ground that we all share. Um, the Lord's Prayer is probably one of the most recited, if not the most recited prayer in history. Uh, certainly well studied and written about, preached about. So uh, today uh, we're going to do some things along with our study guide that kind of goes over some of the things that we can take. Maybe some new insights, I hope. Um, It was actually an answer that Jesus gave to a question. And as you know, throughout Jesus's ministry, the disciples questioned Jesus quite frequently, and there were many requests that they made of him. <clears throat> and this was one in which a unnamed disciple asked Jesus, how should we pray? Uh, the Gospels are full of his teachings, and of course it was common as a rabbi, a teacher, to uh, instruct his disciples. And in Mark, or rather Matthew 6 and Luke 11, we see the recordings of Jesus instructing the disciples about prayer. So let's begin. I'm going to read the account from Luke. Luke 11, 1 through 4. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, pray, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. So what do you think of when um, you, uh, when you think about how Jesus was asked very um, specifically about how to pray. Surely being good Jews, they all, all the disciples, uh, practicing Jews, knew how to pray. They were prescribed prayers that, of the Jewish faith and tradition um, and part of their Jewish life. So it wasn't so much about um, how to pray as to what to pray. And I think it was even deeper than that. How often have we struggled or um, felt inadequate in our prayer life? I know I have, and sometimes I am in stand in amazement when I hear uh, wonderful prayer partners that uh, can relate beautiful prayers. Um, certainly, a number come to mind: um, senior saints of our church, Carol Murphy. And Polly Price are two examples. I'm sure you have some in your mind. They have uh, an ease, a spiritual connectedness with God, um, a conversation approach. And I've often um, wondered uh, how I could pray more like that. And so I think the disciples saw in Jesus... Um, being with him day in and day out, and certainly during many of his prayers, that there was a special connection and a special way that Jesus could communicate with God. And I think that was what they were searching for. So one of the things I think we need to key on is just that, um, that connection and intimacy. I understand the disciples' desire to know that or to know more about how Jesus uh, had that special ability to connect with God. 
I think Jesus knew in our human frailty that we all need to help, that we all need help in instruction and in modeling uh, in terms of our prayer life. And so uh, he gave us a very specific prayer, uh, one that I believe gave us a very um, good model as guidance in how we should approach prayer. Um, so let's look at some of those aspects of the prayer. So it begins, Our Father. So I want us to focus in this section on identity. His identity, but just as important, our identity. <clears throat> so we say Our Father, which implies not only His position, but it also secures our, or implies our position as his children, our identity as his children. And we affirm our identity first and foremost, along with uh, his um, fatherhood. Jesus, God's son, uh, through Jesus, uh, we have our standing as children of God, as believers and followers of Christ. We are God's child through Jesus, we may directly access our Father. And that is no small thing. In fact, that is a huge thing. Um, there are many examples of religion and, and even in, in other uh, traditions of Christian faith that require have required um, believers to go through other people to access God and through Jesus, we can pray directly, and it's very, very important that we value that and that we claim that. Jesus establishes that relationship with God, and we can establish that connection of through Jesus with God. So identity is number one. How would be your name? In this section, we honor God. We show uh, we acknowledge him as holy. Um, we acknowledge his eminence and his separateness over all things in our existence. Um, so much of our life uh, uh, in connection with our earthly fathers, um, we do the same thing. We uh, have a connection, an intimacy even, and we also have a respect and we understand that they have provided for us, and in honoring God in this way, we acknowledge uh, who He is, and that He is God, and that we are not. We acknowledge uh, a submission in the next section. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Uh, we acknowledge His spiritual kingdom, his authority, and we align our will with his will. Um, that submission is critical uh, in uh, as we consider that we need to not pray for ourselves only and for our own needs only or for our um, limited knowledge of what we need, but that we recognize that God knows knows it all, that God understands even better than we do that we, uh, what we need and how we need it. So we say, thy will be done, and we align our will with his. It is a way that we conform to God's will above our own. Next, we talk about give us each day. And this is um, a focus on dependence. Jesus next instructs us to ask for our daily needs from our Father. We live in such opulence compared to the people of that day in Jesus' time and, and compared to most people this, these days. Probably compared to 80% of today's population, we uh, don't live necessarily day to day, hand to mouth, and many people don't have that blessing. So it's difficult for us maybe to, to uh, understand the concept of our daily bread. Um, I think it's important that we understand that the Israelites 
this is in the context of the Israelites' manna, which was provided you know, by God daily, that they could only gather enough for one day, and that they had that reliance on God. So it's a reliance, it's a dependence that we acknowledge um, that we are dependent on God for our daily provisions. It comes down to a matter of trust. Um, do we do our hearts reflect dependence on God's gift and provision, or do we only trust and depend on our own human abilities? Jesus instructs us to ask and trust God for our daily provisions in whatever form and depend on him. Some commentators relate this section with Jesus as the bread of life. Um, that section is, um, or that scripture is John 6, and I'll read that for us here. John 6, 32, Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, I Say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So there is a concept here that uh, is related to our relationship with Jesus um, and through him to God that we need a daily dose. We need the daily presence and it has to be renewed. Um, God's mercies are new every morning. So our daily bread is an important concept of our dependence on, on Jesus. The prayer goes on, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who, uh, who owe us, our debtors. Forgiveness is what Jesus addresses next, and it's an interesting, it's interesting that he would include that as a very important part of our prayer life. And I like what our, re our teacher, uh, writer rather, of the lesson says about this. So let me read uh, their comments. Why would Jesus emphasize forgiveness? He could have told disciples, the disciples to pray for other things. He could have emphasized the need for God's mercy in the world, or he could have told them to pray about their relationships with family and friends, or they could have prayed about the needs of the sick. Instead, Jesus emphasized forgiveness. Why? Because like the body needs food, the soul needs forgiveness, both to give it and to receive it. Forgiveness is a human's biggest need. Jesus understood that a person remains under the wrath of God until God forgives that person their sins through the personal sacrifice of Jesus. And Jesus understood what happens to a person who, uh, who harbors unforgiveness in their heart. They become bitter and decay from the inside out. So it was important um, in Jesus's mind um, that in our communications with, with God and our prayer life that we address our need for forgiveness, but at the same time, understand that God forgives us and that it is critical in our walk, in our spiritual walk, that we forgive others. In fact, in Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew 6, after giving um, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, he relates uh, very specific information about forgiveness. So let me go there real quickly. In Matthew 6, 14, and he has just finished the Lord's Prayer. And he goes on to say, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others for their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. So he links the Lord's Prayer with that section, that teaching on forgiveness. So do we address these issues in our daily prayers? 
honestly looking at how blessed we are through Christ Jesus' sacrifice that we can have forgiveness and of our sins, and we honestly address in our own lives those that we need to forgive. Um, and that is all done, I think, in order to walk more closely with God, to have an open communication. It's exactly what Jesus instructs us to do, not only here in this prayer, but throughout his ministry. And uh, it, it helps by, in forgiving, it helps us unclutter our lives, our spiritual lives, so that we can more closely communicate with God. The prayer goes on, and lead us not into temptation. I've struggled at times with the concept that God could lead us into temptation. Um, I believe that uh, there is a, a, an interesting commentary on the, the terminology here, the, the translation of the word, the Greek word perissimos, um, has a range of translations, temptation, testing, or trial. And our lesson writer relates, you know, more that God uh, would allow some trials, as he does. Um, but James, in uh, James 1, 13 and 14, he, it's clear uh, that he clarifies this for us. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So many scholars feel that the concept here is probably better translated, let us not fall into temptation. But either way, um, whether it's fall into temptations or relieve us from trials, certainly there's a link between temptation, sinning, and trials. We all have been there. Uh, there are consequences. Um, but I think the key here also is what comes next, and that is the word, the three-letter word, B-U-T, but. So it's a linking word, and it links us with the next section. But deliver us from evil. And that no small word is uh, helps us link the former words, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, some translations talk about this being the evil one or even Satan. Um, but I think the key here is that um, whether it's temptations, trials, that we acknowledge that God is capable, that God is wanting to, uh, for us to be reliant on him, that we acknowledge our need of and reliance on the loving Father who can and does deliver us from those situations. We acknowledge our place, our dependence, and God's omnipotence and grace. A really appropriate place that the original prayer actually ends. Um, it kind of comes back to the fact that God is God and we are not, and our reliance on him should be ultimate. The doxology portion of the traditional prayer, which we pray often, um, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That section is found in a later um, manuscript of Matthew's account and has been added throughout uh, probably from the first or second century on. And what a powerful doxology it is. It's a wonderful ending to this magnificent um, model prayer. So how do we apply Jesus' instructions uh, in our prayer life? And that's something we all must uh, evaluate for ourselves. Where is our heart when we pray? Are we truly connecting with the Father? Do we know our identity and pray as confident children? Confident not in ourselves, but in our all-powerful, loving, and merciful Father God. Do we show him honor and submit to his will, not our will? Do we truly depend on him for all things, small and large, and acknowledge our gratefulness? Do we acknowledge our sins and ask for forgiveness while forgiving those who have wronged us, thereby 
clearing away the clutter in our lives that restricts our intimacy with God. So these concepts um, are not new. Um, it's interesting how um, Jesus chose to give us the specific words, the specific concept, concepts. Uh, the model prayer, I think, is uh, a way for us to categorize our uh, the needs of our prayer life and to model our um, prayers after this to help us um, become more intimate with God, um, to more clearly identify areas in our own life that we need his grace and mercy and work. So let's be thankful that we have this wonderful prayer. And uh, as we move forward and model Jesus, let's model him not only in our prayer life, but in all of our actions and in all of our daily life. So thank you for joining us for this lesson. Um, grateful for your presence with us online for the technology to do this. Next week, uh, we'll look at prayer to heal our land. So once again, blessings, have a good week.